Hello, I'm Dr. Nick Fell Fox, and this is my lecture, Nietzsche and Sartre, Twin Philosophers of Paradox, a significantly abridged version of my forthcoming book of the same title. Nietzsche and Sartre, Twin Philosophers of Paradox. Friedrich Nietzsche and Jean-Paul Sartre are perhaps the most celebrated, but also the most misunderstood of modern philosophers. But what exactly was their philosophy, and how do we best understand it? Furthermore, what was the connection between these two existentialist icons? Were they antithetical or parallel thinkers? The connection between Nietzsche and Sartre is a topic that is often alluded to, but rarely discussed in any sort of systematic way. Here, I set out to break this relative silence and achieve the following objectives. Firstly, to establish Nietzsche and Sartre as twin thinkers with a shared genetic code across the range of their philosophy, including the areas of ethics, ontology, the self, and politics. Secondly, to establish Nietzsche and Sartre as primarily philosophers of a fertile and deconstructive form of paradoxical thinking that goes against metaphysical humanism and anticipates many trends in contemporary post-humanist thought. Thirdly, to cast a critical eye on contemporary Nietzsche and Sartre scholarship, especially in relation to the emergence of the new Nietzsche and new Sartre. And finally, to show biographical connections by way of the Lebensphilosophie, illustrating how the philosophy of contradiction and ambiguity played itself out in significant aspects of their lives and selves, including their relation to the feminine, their love of music and their final years of madness and imaginary contamination. The philosophical connection between Nietzsche and Sartre has been described variously as ambiguous, uncertain and unclear. This is reflected in Sartre's own ambivalent attitude towards the German philosopher. On the one hand, he relates an interview in the 1970s how Nietzsche stood for nothing in particular to him and how I hated him, particularly for his crap about the elite and the ubermensch. And yet, on the other, Sartre's first and final philosophical texts were both about Nietzsche. Furthermore, his first novel, Une Défaite, was a short story in which he sympathetically imagined himself to be Nietzsche as part of the Tribschen Triangle with Richard and Cosima Wagner. François Nudelmann reads Nietzsche's influence on Sartre in this way as that of an imaginary contamination. And it is my intention here to show, imaginary or not, how Sartre's philosophy is contaminated and suffused with Nietzschean themes, which in many instances he expands and develops further. Paradoxical thinking. The first thing one quickly comes to terms with upon a close reading of Nietzsche and Sartre is their paradoxical and ambiguous thinking. As Karl Jaspers complained of Nietzsche, one finds it insufferable that Nietzsche says first this, then that, and then something entirely different. For any proposition in Nietzsche, one can usually find its opposite somewhere else in his work. Self-contradiction is a fundamental ingredient in Nietzsche's thought. Similarly, Sartre's entire life can be seen in Ronald Heyman's terms as a process of writing against himself. Contradiction and self-contestation are essential to any proper understanding of Sartre. This contradiction hangs over their recommendations on how to read their work, which, like their thought in general, often vacillates between the poles of humanism and anti-humanism. In Beyond Good and Evil, for instance, Nietzsche tells us there is absolutely nothing impersonal about the philosopher, a theme he reiterates often, and yet, in human all too human, he declares when the book opens its mouth, the author must shut his. In interview in 1979, Sartre asserts, you have to take into account the life of people who write. It is projected in the writing in one way or another. And yet in what is literature, we are told that the text towers above its author. In The Family Idiot, Sartre goes even further in displacing the author from the text. It seems in this way that their texts are booby-trapped, to use Brian Leiter's phrase, and are therefore destined to easily confuse or mislead the unwary reader down errant paths. Entelechy. To grasp the forest of their thinking, 
it is necessary to see beyond individual trees and to view their work as a whole, as containing subtle shifts within a discernible line of development and unity, a kind of living entelechy, as Horst Hutter describes it, in which later stages recuperate early ones and early ones hold in themselves all grounds of future unfolding. It is only with a totalising view of the entirety of their works that we can fully appreciate the rich ambiguities and resolutions in their thinking. This means taking seriously those texts such as Nietzsche's The Will to Power and Sartre's Hope Now that some scholars dismiss. As Jaspers remarked, there are no privileged texts in Nietzsche. To understand him fully, we need to read the entirety of his works in a comparative way, experiencing both the systematic possibilities of his thinking as well as the likely possibility of their collapse. It is as though a mountain wall had been dynamited, Jaspers wrote. The rocks, already more or less shaped, convey the idea of the whole. New Nietzsche and New Sartre. Even as Nietzsche still drew breath in his final years of insanity, those closest to him were mining for the rights to the philosopher's mind. To his sister, Elizabeth, he was a deep, serious and systematic philosopher, while his former lover, Luz Dalome, portrayed him in opposite terms as an exuberant, playful and stylistic thinker, whose three transitions in thinking relate to the different situations and periods in his life leading inexorably into excess and madness. After the Nazification of Nietzsche in the first half of the 20th century by German philosophers such as Böhmler and Rosenberg, who emphasised his system of will to power as a political ontology of force and domination, a new Nietzsche was born in reaction to this in France after the war. Rescuing Nietzsche from his blood and thunder caricature and from the reading of Heidegger, who viewed him as the last metaphysician and the culmination of the Platonic tradition in philosophy, the French post-structuralist portrayed a very different philosopher. The Salomian rebirthing of Nietzsche by Derrida, Deleuze, Foucault and Kaufmann in Paris in the 1960s presented the new Nietzsche as a playful deconstructionist who overturned the faith in oppositional and metaphysical thinking, problematizing the notions of truth objectivity, language and the subject. A similar fate also befell Sartre, whose image has evolved and transformed in the 40 years since his death. Seeing beyond the confines of the old Sartre, who was constructed primarily as a Cartesian dualist thinker, the new Sartre has emerged stemming initially from the volte face of post-structuralists like Derrida and Foucault, who changed their attitude to Sartre from one of parricidal attack in the 1960s into one of homage in the 1980s. It was, however, Christina Howes' seminal reading of post-war French philosophy that gave birth in full to the new Sartre, significantly recasting him in philosophical terms as resolutely anti-Cartesian and as a precursor and originator of many of the themes that the post-structuralists later themselves adopted. He is therefore, like Nietzsche, I argue here, a deconstructionist, anti-metaphysical thinker who can be seen clearly to anticipate many contemporary post-humanist themes and ideas. The decentered self. The first of these themes is the decentered self. Did Nietzsche dissolve or deify the self? This is a difficult question alluded to in what Brian Leiter calls Nietzsche's paradox of determinism and self-creation that runs throughout his work. Equally, Robert Solomon has brought attention to Sartre's theoretical shift from absolute freedom in his early work to a full-blooded determinism in his later period. We may also note the paradoxical nature of Sartre's description of consciousness in being a nothingness. It is what it is not, and is not what it is. The bewitched ego. Both thinkers decenter the self in terms of bodily, linguistic, and social factors, but this is an affirmative decentering that aims at the promotion of new subjectivities, or what Nietzsche refers to as new versions of the soul hypothesis. For both of these philosophers, the subject is the synthetic construct of the activity of consciousness and not its owner. This unites their attack on the transcendental ego of Descartes and Kant, that they both saw as a symptom and as a product of philosophical bewitchment. <laughs>
the three ecologies of self. A full understanding of the Nietzschean and Sartrean self requires us to articulate the relational or intersectional interplay of what, following Guattari, we can call the three ecologies of self, that is, the material, body and environment, the social, language and other, and the psychological, what Nietzsche calls giving style to oneself, and what Sartre terms authenticity. It is clear that these twin philosophers give significant emphasis to the heaviness of our bodily and social conditioning, the power of instinctual physiological experience and language in framing the self. But their philosophy also aims creatively at an aesthetic and affirmative construction of subjectivity. We can, Sartre maintains, always make something out of what is made of us. For Nietzsche, this means cultivating the intellectual conscience, a rare and difficult art as he describes it, but one in which the me is a partner in the conversation of the subject. Homo ludens. The route to achieving this is through art and play, which they both propose as antidotes to the spirit of seriousness and the patterns of bad faith that are obstructive to practices of freedom and self-creation. This aesthetic and ludic Nietzschean Sartrean construct of the self was later taken up and adopted fully by post-structuralists such as Foucault and Deleuze, who, as mentioned, originally mistook and misrepresented Sartre as a Cartesian thinker in their anxiety of influence towards him. A creative ethics. Another area of confluence between Nietzschean and Sartrean philosophy is ethical and political theory. If Sartre had finished and published his very fine study of Nietzschean ethics, as Simone de Beauvoir described it, which he began in 1947 and was still working on in his final years, it would likely have been concerned with the diagnosis of nihilism in the wake of the death of God and the possibility of an affirmative response to it in the form of a creative ethics. This, in Christina Degler's view, is the very crux of their connection. Nietzsche's revaluation of values. The principal target of Nietzsche's revaluation of values was customary morality, which he argued in the works of his middle period was stifling to freedom and self-determination. Customary morality defends conformity to the sanctity and inscrutability of tradition and inexplicable indeterminate power behind our thinking that lies beyond the personal. It requires a regime of habit and obedience that turns humanity into a self-undermining, perpetual sacrifice. We must become free spirits in Nietzsche's view in order to become what we are by being the harshest critic of ourselves and giving style to ourselves by novel experiments in living and diverse practices of self-cultivation. In his later work, Nietzsche's moral exemplars are that of Zarathustra and the Übermensch, who legislate their own values and signify a new type of human being no longer weighed down by resentment and conformity. Sartre's two ethics Many scholars view Sartrean ethics as dividing into two phases, but as William Remley and Adrian Mervish have argued, there is more of a continuity than a duality, as many of Sartre's later ethical themes, such as reciprocity, are present, if sometimes only implicitly, in his earliest work. Like Nietzsche, Sartre stresses the importance of creating new moral values that promote freedom and self-determination through play artistic creation and imaginative experiments in living. As he states in his notebooks for an ethics, the essential moment therefore is that of creation, that is, the moment of the imaginary, of invention. And naturally, the negative moment is essentially bound to the imaginary since man chooses to illuminate what is in the light of what is not. Nietzsche against Nietzsche. In finding congruence between Nietzsche and Sartre, perhaps the thorniest area is that of political thought. As Noodleman comments, everything would seem to oppose the aristocratic thinker Nietzsche to the anti-elitist philosopher Sartre. Comparing the two, Degler highlights the lack of an appeal to the other in Nietzsche and his inability to progress from an ethics of virtue to a politics of virtue. Although Nietzsche's elitism reverberates in his later works, a more ambiguous reading is evident, as many scholars have pointed out, 
in his middle works, such as Daybreak and Human All Too Human, that exude a much more equivocal attitude to egalitarianism and democracy. Positive agonism. Some, such as William Connolly, Mark Warren and Lawrence Hattab, have proceeded to use Nietzsche against Nietzsche in this way as a means of creating a new democratic or gentle philosopher whose political logic of pluralism, based on a theory of positive agonism, they view as more consistent with his wider genealogical deconstruction of power, his ontological insights into self and other, and his affirmative virtue ethics. In a similar vein, the French Nietzscheans have used Nietzsche's deconstructive logic to develop a form of anarchism that aligns very closely with Sartre's political thinking. This anarchistic political logic, based on agonism and the dynamic or emergent interaction of self and other, represents in turn an anti-metaphysical form of political thinking that overcomes the dualistic and static constructions often found in liberal or communitarian theory. Smooth ontology. This leads us to ontology, third major area of confluence between Nietzschean and Sartrean philosophy. In A Thousand Plateau, Deleuze and Guattari distinguish between postmodern smooth space and modern striated space. In striated space, one closes off a surface and allocates it according to determinate intervals, assigned breaks. In the smooth, one distributes oneself in an open space. As Rosegi notes, the category of the outside that circulates in Deleuze and Guattari's idea of a smooth space is rooted in the very ontology of being a nothingness, in which consciousness must constantly realise its being outside of itself, temporally and spatially. Indeed, in general terms, Nietzsche's concept of the will to power and Sartre's idea of dialecticality both conform closely to Deleuze and Guattari's concept of smoothness and to their magic formula outlined in A Thousand Plateaus of pluralism equals monism. Nietzsche's relational ontology. Despite their vaunted reputation as individualists, Nietzsche and Sartre are thoroughly relational thinkers. This springs largely in Nietzsche's case, as Alan Schrift and Eugen Fink have suggested, from the Heraclitian foundations of Nietzsche's philosophy that revolve around the conjunctive unity of opposites, in contrast to metaphysical thinking that emphasizes their separation and disjunction. Sartre's decapitated dialectic. Sartre's philosophy in being a nothingness and the critique is also axiomatically arranged around the same Heraclitian logic. As Matthew Eshelman points out, in being a nothingness, pour and en soi are two different modalities of being and not distinct ontological entities. Sartre's method of abstraction and separation in the first part of the book is only a provisional abstraction that he dissolves in the second part in favour of the unity of being in the world. Equally, in the critique, as Matthew Alley shows, Sartre consistently dissolves binaristic categories always in search of a proliferating ternary logic, a dialectic that avoids the closure and the logic of identity that Deleuze took exception to with Hegel. Sartre's decapitated dialectic, or dialectic with holes, as Thomas Flynn describes it, is one that emphasises openness, contingency, incompletion and emergence, and thus resonates with Deleuze's own anti-Hegelian deconstruction of static dualisms. In his early notebook, Sartre expresses an admiration for Nietzsche's terrestrial thought that relates to the living earth and plenum of existence and not to some imagined or fictitious transcendent realm. This is reflected in the importance they both assign to the body and in the effective earthly phenomenology of embodied consciousness in the world. And framers or enchanters. Like in all aspects of their philosophy, however, ambiguity encompasses their conception of the natural world. Should we view these two philosophers, for instance, as humanist enframers or as post-humanist enchanters? Heidegger, for one, saw Nietzsche as a philosopher of enframing, his will to power a fully developed manifestation of the humanistic logic of control and domination. This is reinforced by Nietzsche's constant references in his later work to nature as an arena of struggle, exploitation and suffering. In contrast to this, however, 
His view of nature and the birth of tragedy is more aesthetic, joyous and rapturous. Lampert, for instance, views Nietzsche's ecological credentials through this latter lens, aligning with Deleuze, Guattari and Japanese Nietzscheans, such as Keiji Nishitani, who conceived the will to power as an abundant, creative, aesthetic and magical force in nature, perceiving in Nietzsche's Dionysian fidelity to the earth a celebratory form of pantheistic thinking. Equally so with Sartre, those who view him in Cartesian terms, of which there are many, see him as reproducing a logic of domination and appropriation and point to the trenchantly negative depictions of nature in his early work, especially in Nausea. Others, however, such as William McBride, André Gores and Matthew Alley, discern a nascent if undeveloped environmental logic in his work, a different ecological Sartre to the Cartesian thinker of control depicted by the old Sartreans. Although there is a certain equivocation between humanism and post-humanism that circulates in Nietzsche's and Sartre's philosophy of nature, and, as Ali recommends, a certain nudging of Sartre away from some of his anthropocentric assumptions is a requirement for yielding his ecological insights to the full, it is clear that their terrestrial thought, their effective phenomenology of enchantment and magic, their view of the body, and their smooth relational ontology anticipate and prefigure important developments in contemporary post-humanist theory, such as eco-phenomenology, vibrant materialism, quantum entanglement and speculative realism. Lebensphilosophy We cannot really understand the dynamic philosophy of these two iconic existentialists without an appreciation of their Lebensphilosophy. It is in the interlacing of bios and mind, or the space between Nietzsche and Sartre as living, breathing men, and the personae of their texts, as Alexander Nehemas has argued, where we find the deepest articulation, the richest ambiguities, and the vitality of their thinking. It is in this interstitial space that we discover the living embodiment of their paradoxical but liberating philosophy. Gentle Nietzsche and feminine Sartre. Both Nietzsche and Sartre grew up without a father and spent several of their years as adults living with their mother. Their relationship to the feminine, as most scholars would agree, was ambivalent. Willow Verkerk talks, for instance, of Nietzsche's misogynist straitjacket, but at the same time argues for the importance of his genealogy and ethics of emancipation for feminist thought. Derrida, Irigare and Kaufmann have all highlighted the ambivalence towards the feminine in Nietzsche. Sarah Kaufmann shows how there are several images of the female at play in Nietzsche's work, the most important of which is the figure of Baobao, a Greek goddess whom Nietzsche discusses and celebrates in the preface to the second edition of The Gay Science as a source of fecund and artistic creativity. So too with Sartre, Brought up by his mother, with whom he shared a close, almost sisterly relationship, he generally preferred feminine company to that of men. But, as Boulet notes, this was marked by a duality and a divided sense of self for Sartre, where, in the public domain, he exhibited masculine, narcissistic and aggressive tendencies, while suppressing his feminine side, which he expressed only in the intimacy of his coterie of lovers, and at the piano with his mother, Anne-Marie, and later with his adopted daughter, Arlette. In Boulet's view, Sartre's thought took a decidedly feminine turn after 1973, when he was no longer able to write and formed a close, intimate relationship with his secretary, Pierre Victor. In this period, Sartre was also working on developing the concept of the matricielle, or Mother Matrix, which, as Guillermin de Lacoste has pointed out, has much in common with what Hélène Sixou calls a feminine economy of reciprocal abandon in personal and social relationships. This abandon is not a negative, purely passive thing, but relates in a positive way to the notion of de-selfing or de-egoisation. Philosophers of Androgyny as Boulet and Rudiger Safransky have suggested, it is possible in this light to think of these twin philosophers as androgynous thinkers, a concept that they both apply to themselves at various points and which would seem consistent with their anti-dualistic ternary thinking. The Piano <laughs> 
In his excellent book, The Philosopher's Touch, Noodleman illustrates the philosophical compatibility of Nietzsche and Sartre through their mutual love of music and playing the piano. The many hours that they sat at the piano, in Noodleman's view, is a living embodiment or vignette of their Lebensphilosophy, signifying a personal sphere of Dionysianism for Nietzsche and that of a tactile phenomenology for Sartre, where Portua and Ansoa coalesce, putting into action their creative ethics of art and play and their smooth, effective ontology. Playing the piano was also a form of feminine sociality. They both played almost exclusively in female company and were fond of playing piano pieces written for four hands that involved collaboration and intimacy. Epiphany and Madness, Turin and Bilanco. In his final years of insanity, Nietzsche hardly uttered a word, but could still improvise fluently at the piano for hours on end, a form, you might say, of complete Dionysian dispersal. This, it can be seen, reveals a recurring tension that runs through his view of the self, as it does also for Sartre, between centering and dispersal, the former present in his idea of the intellectual conscience, and the latter more prominent in his Dionysian-inspired texts, especially The Birth of Tragedy. Nietzsche and Sartre were plagued with madness and melancholia throughout their lives. Some, like Luz Alome and Thomas Mann, saw this as the logical culmination of Nietzsche's radical experiments in thinking and Leben's philosophy, a departure to far-off shores from which he was unlikely to return. As Nietzsche declared in Daybreak, those who cannot stand their ground above the law and moral conformity must find another law or seek refuge in madness. Like Nietzsche, Sartre was afflicted by deep melancholia and psychosis at various points in his life. This leaks into his work, particularly in his early study on the imagination, which coincided with his experimentation with mescaline in 1938, and from which he developed a recurring psychosis connected with a fear of crabs and lobsters. In his final years, Sartre's adult brain was seen by many to be manipulated by Victor and his imagination ran riot over reality, when on occasions, as Beauvoir recounted, he believed himself to be various fictional characters, just as he had done in his childhood. Their shared madness is illustrated most notably through two epiphanal moments that symbolise their perceived decline, but also prefigure a new emancipated self. Nietzsche, in Turin in 1889, where he rescues a horse from being beaten by its owner in the piazza, throwing his arms around the animal and bursting into tears, and Sartre at the Renault factory in Bilancourt in 1974, standing on a barrel preaching to the deaf ears of the workers stood behind the factory gates. In Boulet's reckoning, this moment reveals a positive, more inclusive and feminine Sartre who was always thinking against himself and attempting to change the role of the intellectual into a new postmodernist configuration. In Nietzsche's case, it shows a gentle, compassionate Nietzsche, very much in contrast to the bloody Nietzsche and his entrenched moral pathos of distance. As Safransky remarks, the philosopher who later assailed the morality of compassion displayed an almost osmotic sympathy. He could not be as nearly as ruthless as he demanded from his Ubermensch. We should, in this respect, view their madness ambiguously as both enabling and disabling, creative and destructive, a living instantiation and a phenomenological demonstration of how reason and unreason ultimately bleed into one another. To dismiss their final years out of hand as of no importance in the trajectory of their thinking is to be guilty of what Christine Howells identifies as modern philosophy's tendency not to focus on the subject's disintegration, weakness and ultimate dissolution in the radical alterity of death. To eject conceptions of subjectivity, that is, that manifest the true vulnerability and fragility of the subject. Conclusion twin philosophers of paradox. As Nietzsche declared in On the Genealogy of Morals, the ability to bear contradictions and to contain or negotiate opposites in the right way is a sign of philosophical and cultural strength.
Here I have attempted to show, in all areas of their philosophy, how their paradoxical thinking points beyond and deconstructs dualistic metaphysical thinking. If one delves deeply enough, there are a plethora of binarisms that they both unpick, problematize and elucidate through a pluralizing paradoxical logic. This is a cluster that immediately comes to mind. Subject, object, self, other, reason, madness, conscious, unconscious, reason, emotion, male, female, human, animal, free will, determinism, consciousness, body, art, science, humanism, anti-humanism, centering, decentering, meaning, unmeaning, truth, falsity, self-affirmation, self-denial. For every one of these dualisms, one can find a certain equivocation in their thinking. However, this is not a debilitating logic, but a resolutely liberating one. One that illuminates the living ambiguities of existence that came into sharp focus within their own lives. It is only by reading Nietzsche and Sartre in this way, as pioneers of an anti-metaphysical, ambiguous thinking, and by travelling along all of their winding and discrepant paths, that we can fully understand and appreciate the rich thought of these twin laboratories of philosophical wisdom.